In Ableton Live 11.3, there's a new synthesizer called Drift. And Drift is meant to be extremely expressive and to capture the inconsistencies and warmth of real analog hardware synthesizers. And if you've paid any attention to the sound design work I've done in my hundreds of Ableton Live packs over the last few years, then you can probably guess that I love Drift. I've been designing my own presets for Drift for the last couple weeks, and it's incredible. Right now, you're hearing me improvise on some of those presets I made with Drift. I've got a free pack of 10 presets that you can have for your music over at brianfunk.com slash drift. It even includes a 16-pad drum rack where each drum sound is made up of a Drift preset. But I actually made 50 different presets. And all 50 of those presets are only available to members of my music production club because you guys are my biggest supporters. Members of the music production club always get my newest creation as soon as it's released. My educational materials, including video courses, my books, helpful PDFs, and they're part of a really cool, supportive community of fellow music makers. And I love that community. We have a Discord server where I get to hear people's music. We get together and hang out for live Zoom meetings, share our music, share tips, do projects together. It's so much fun and really exciting and inspiring for me to share this community with everybody. And there's also bonus materials for the Music Production Club, which are basically just free stuff from my store that I put on there every once in a while. So if you want to get all 50 of these Drift presets, sign up for the Music Production Club at brianfunk.com mpc. I'm really proud of these presets. They're so expressive and deep, and some of them have maybe a reverb or a delay on them or maybe an arpeggiator, but almost all of them are just drift itself without any effects. It's amazing what you can do with this synthesizer, and I had a lot of fun making these sounds, and I think they're gonna work really nicely in all kinds of different music genres. So if you wanna get your hands on 10 free drift presets, go to brianfunk.com drift. If you want all 50, join the club brianfunk.com slash mpc. Thanks a lot and enjoy this episode of the Music Production Podcast. Hello everybody, welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have a special guest, Will Doggett. Will is from From Studio to Stage, the YouTube channel where he talks about bringing your music to the stage. He's got so much good information about that. Where I mean, it's kind of the place to go for this topic. If you want to go to like a stage show with your songs, uh, Will's got it covered on just about every level. He's a fellow Ableton certified trainer. And we spoke just last week for his own podcast, which is uh, Behind the Space Bar, which you should check out. You can see that on his YouTube channel again. That's from studio to stage. We had a great time and now we're reversing things and here we are on the Music Production Podcast. What's up, Will? Good to see you again, man. I'm so nervous. I've heard you're a really tough interviewer and you're going to (laughs) have me spill all my secrets and I'll be crying and jumping on the couch by the end of all this. Yeah, no softballs here, you know? It's only the hard questions. (laughs) Well, I'm excited. Yeah, Brian, this is is super great. I... uh, I've been looking forward, you know, we did our conversation last week and I told my wife, I was like, man, that was like super fun. Like I could have gone another hour and then I was like, oh wait, we are going to go like another hour. It's just going to be for your podcast next week. So um, this is going to be fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Good thing it worked out that way, right? That's right. (laughs) Otherwise we'd both be dreading it. But yeah, um, you know, I've really loved your work and I think it's so cool that you've got this very specific angle that you take and you've covered like just about everything, you know, just kind of looking at your videos right now. I mean, everything from like monitors and cue mixes and gear and just even just um, stuff inside of like Ableton Live, like yeah. tips and tricks. Um, what made you decide to go that angle where you, you know, that's, you're like the guy now for this type of thing. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the easy answer for me is that's what I know. And that's um, that's like how I use Ableton the majority of the time. And I, I started with Ableton um, as a singer-songwriter. Um, I wouldn't even say singer-songwriter. As more of just recording my songs, right? So just playing guitar. 
I'm a guitar player primarily. And I just started like, I just want to create some songs. Uh, I'm not going to really release them. I just want to create some songs. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, I was playing in bands and this whole idea of backing tracks and playing with a click track and adding in these other elements like was a really interesting, unique idea to me. And so got into Ableton from that perspective. And um, and you know, I think there is, um, th you always hear people talk about the value of finding your niche and like doing your thing. And there was an interesting phase I kind of went through of, there was a period, you know, became an Ableton Live certified trainer, was creating content, doing sound design content, which is, uh, you know, another thing I really, really love and particularly creating keyboard patches and presets and stuff. Um, and I love that and I was doing it. And I remember two scenarios in particular, one being at full sale for, I believe the push one launch and Ableton hired me to like, Hey, let's go announce push one, um, in the Florida area. I was living in Fort Lauderdale at the time. So head up to full sale, uh, and teach this class. And so I go up as the world, like, like, Finger drumming is so far out of my vocabulary of things I'm good at that like, I mean, it's just so far out of the realm of things I'm I'm great at. And so I go to like demo push one and it's a very technical, like here's how to do this. And I can press this mode and do that. But I'm like trying to do some demos and it's like every white guy beat, you know, kind of thing. It was just awful. But I'm like, I'm looking, and then after me, Da Vinci comes up, which if you know Da Vinci, like finger yeah. drumming and performing with push, like, oh my goodness. And so he just wipes the floor with me. But I remember walking away from that event and I still have the poster somewhere and everyone had like a really cool name. There was a guy that was like, um, I want to say it was like Beef Wellington or something, but but maybe that wasn't his actual name, but uh, Da Vinci was there, like all these cool DJs that had cool personalities and cool stuff. And I remember walking away with my buddy and I was like, I'm like the backing track guy, you know? And um, and then going to an Ableton certified trainer thing at South by Southwest and these like legends are in the room, Laura Escade, uh, you know, all these other certified trainers. And I just felt so like, I remember telling my wife, I was like, I, I don't fit in, like I'm not good enough, you know? And we talked a little bit last week about imposter syndrome and that sort of thing. And um, I just got to a place where I realized uh, I had enough really talented, like amazingly, far along in their careers, uh, you know, like defining people in the world of playback say, man, I love your content. I love the stuff you've created for me to finally be like, oh, like just be confident in what you know. I don't have to go, you know, be as uh, great of a performer on Push as Da Vinci to like create content that's beneficial. And then that works out because if you search Ableton on YouTube, it's, it's primarily going to be like production stuff it's going to be how to record your own music but not going to be a lot of how to perform your music live on stage and then let's niche down even further there's live looping which is the cool sexy like it looks like i'm doing really difficult things because i am and then there's pressing space bar which is by you know i'm like hence behind the space bar if anyone's wondering why the name is called that hence kind of the world i'm in and there's with anything in life there's so much more to it than just pressing space bar but finding that niche it's kind of like that's just because of where I was and what I was doing, but it took me a little bit to get there and be comfortable. And again, now it's just, it's such a joy to, you know, work with amazing companies and just help people understand how to truly get their songs from the studio to the stage and, and perform that with confidence. Hmm. I know that feeling, you know, with, uh, just kind of like, how did I get here? I mean, I feel yeah. like half the time I'm doing this podcast, like, how does this happen? Yeah, yeah. You know, who who's gonna figure this out? Yes, yeah. you know, soon enough, someone's gonna realize. We talked about that whole idea, I think, a bit yep. <laughs> last week too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Da Vinci. I mean, that's that's a guy that can really demo anything with pads. Yeah. You know, I had him on the podcast a while back now, and I mean, he's just incredible with yep. his he's like a black belt in real life and on the push and on that's awesome. of, um, you know instrument like that and then yeah laura askaday who's also been on um she's you know kind of pioneered a lot of that stuff yeah and, you know working with kanye west and logic and like people like that it's, i could imagine showing up for that would be a little intimidating but it's like you said um you're doing it you know you were there you there's a reason why they hired you, right, to show up. Like that's that's one thing. Yeah. And um, 
I guess we could always kind of do this sort of like comparison thing with everybody we look at. But um, it's great, great advice, you know, just to be confident in what you know. Yeah. I, something I've been thinking a lot about, and I don't want to turn this into a um, self-help, like personal development thing, but I, <clears throat> I've been thinking a lot about just the idea of uh, success and like you, you'll see people and sometimes they'll say like, if you want to live a successful life or whatever. And, um, and it's interesting because to me, it's such a personal thing. Like it's, success is not a thing. Like success mm. is what do I define as success? And, um, you know, for me, like I've, I've gotten, it's ironic that I went through that journey because now I would say of people I know around me, like I tend to be someone who cares the less of the, the least about what people think about me but that's only because I went through this kind of journey of realizing like being comfortable with who I am being comfortable I think with uh, my talents my giftings and realizing they're different than other people and it's it's a lot easier to be confident in your abilities when you're like have achieved some again I'm going to use the word which means nothing success in that field like it's a lot easier for me to be confident now than it was when I was recording in my apartment in Fort Lauderdale, you know, with like my MacBook Pro camera and it was terrible, crappy quality. Um, but I think just that idea of success, like whether it's in music, it's in business, it's in relationships, whatever it is, it's like success is just whatever you define it to be. And then, you know, going, envisioning what you see the future to be and then going, how, how can I get there? You know, like what's the path I can take mm. to get there? Um, and that's just such a, such a more like joyful way to live than trying to live up to other people's expectations or living your your whole life concerned about what other people are going to think of the decision you made like just make the decision and just go about your day you know like that's kind of um it's been a big thing for me over the past two years you know maybe even even more it's probably tied in a lot to like launching the company um and going on your own and it's like this is my only gig if people, to a certain extent, I care what people think because if they don't like what I'm doing, then I can't pay the bills. But, you know, um, that's just been a real big gift, I think, for me in the past probably three three years or less. It's just confidence in who you are and confidence in your abilities and defining success, um, how you define success, you know? Hmm. Yeah, our culture definitely, when you ask... Uh... You know, if you were to say like, oh, he's a very successful guy, she's very successful. Yeah. I think the first thing people think is, oh, they're making a lot of money. Yeah. Right. Um, but behind so many people like that are unhappy people, right? Yeah. Um, but that knowing that, that definition that you have in your own mind, I mean that can that can easily turn you into just the fact that you were in an apartment with no external validation yet mm. and still soldiering on like that's pretty successful because all of that's coming from within yeah. it's not somebody coming along and validating you with either like work or degree or money or anything like that yeah yeah that's it's, it's hard to take that yeah position sometimes it, it is you kind of go look back and i think part of um particularly when i think about it from a artist perspective um I am, I mean, there's so many w directions and things I'm thinking of now, but like uh, this idea of aspirational identities ha has come up a lot for me and like how I create content and how I think about customers and how I think about my community is like we all aspire to achieve something, we aspire to be something. And a lot of times I think for artists, people that are creating, writing songs, singers, songwriters, producing music, remixing music, whatever they're doing, there's always somebody we look at and we go, man, I just I wish I could achieve the success they have. I wish I could perform in this venue. I wish I could be on this this, uh, this award show. Like I, I wish I could do those things they're doing. And um, I've had just enough interactions with people that are just a high enough level to see how much of their life is managed and controlled by other people to go, I think there's a lot of success in being the person who just, I mean, we kind of talked about this last week, but just being the person who creates music because it's like an outpouring from your soul and something that you do to like, just relax and just chill. Like there, there's a gift and there's a lot of success in that, that it's easy to look on and go, man, I wish I could be that person, but not realizing 
the situation that person is really in, that oftentimes they go, man, I wish I could just go back to being a nobody where I could just create my music, mm -hmm. you know? And you're right, that that's that like success that comes without someone going, hey, great job, great song. It's like, it's just the success of creating, you know? Mm -hmm. Which is no easy task. No, so. no, yeah, yeah, that's right. Definitely, Th that's a big thing I struggle with every single time I do anything. It's mm. like, I never really know if I can do it. The only evidence, I have a little more evidence, you know, from the past that I've been able to complete things and yeah. that's sometimes enough to keep me going. But there's always the dark hour of the soul when mm. you question everything and you think maybe you lost it. Maybe that you did your last one, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you, you're out of juice. Yeah. But, but yeah, and I think too, when you look at things that way, that bar of success, like, oh, if I can only play those venues, if I can mm. only have... Uh, you know, that many streams or whatever, whatever you decide it is, it, you never get there. It's always on the horizon. Yeah. So as soon as you make that big accomplishment a day later, you're thinking like, now what? Now what? Yeah, What's that's right. Next? That's right. Yeah. Next, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I, uh, okay. I'm going to stop. Cause I, I'll say one final thing. And then, cause again, this could completely turn into like personal. Uh, I love this. I mean, cause it's, this is like foundational stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and if you can't get that right, like you know, you can't really build anything off of it, and it's a never-ending thing. And that's something yeah. I'm really trying to come to terms with myself. Is I, you know, I guess I thought like I'd reach this point where like, all right, I got this. You know, now I can do it. Now I can just sit down and bust out music like nobody's business. Yeah, but it doesn't happen like that. It comes in like starts and stops and there's a lot of stops and there's a lot of challenges at every single step along the way. So for me, I'm trying to really come to terms and accept that that's just how it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so much of getting comfortable with that is, is a mindset thing. And mm. there's a lot of self-help that I think that needs to happen to, because I, I understand it intellectually, but it's, Next time I sit down and make music, I'm going to go through the same thing. Yeah. After having this very conversation. I think I, I've been thinking a lot. Um, I don't know what triggered it, but this year, like in particular, mindset is um, mindset is a really big thing for me and something uh, my wife and I are even getting really intentional about um, in ourselves and with our kids is you'll catch yourself like, I did something today and I did it and I caught myself. I was like, oh, I'm such an idiot. And that's just stuff we, mm. we do. But we don't realize those things stack up and you're like, you are an idiot because you remember that one time when that person said, and yeah, you're validating like they were right, you know, and then that leads into that imposter syndrome thing. But there's definitely something to mindset that like we keep telling our kids, I'm like, I don't know that if you think you can do something that you can do it, but I know with 100% certainty, if you don't think you can do something, then you cannot do it. Like you will not achieve it. And I, I think there's like, I mean, I guess it's it's the yin and the yang. It's like the two sides of everything in life, which is um, there is a take a moment and like dream and visualize where you want to be in five years or the thing you want to achieve or you want to release your first album in a year or whatever that thing is. And <clears throat> Napoleon Hill talks about that like one defining purpose, that one definite thought that you're like, I will do this thing. And again, I don't know that necessarily you will do that thing, but I know the people that achieve the things that they set out to do started at some point with, I will achieve this thing, and it gets you there. And I think that's important. But then the other flip side of that is, like you said, which is once you get there, then you're going to be going, okay, what's next? And so I think you've got to view it as a journey, and you view it, view it as, I've always appreciated i think i first heard it around like the pixar thing and seth godin talked about it but kaizen the continuous improvement which kind of came from the toyota manufacturing process of like iterative improvement as opposed to we're going to release the perfect product it's like we're going to release this and then we're going to iterate and then we're going to iterate we're continually improve and continue develop and so i feel like it's um i had a conversation with a friend today of a product that we will release together, which is the first time I've ever worked with someone else to release a product, which is a little scary, that um, I really feel like has 
the potential to be massively successful. Again, how do I define success? But will be really well received. Lots uh, of money. And lots of money <laughs> and, and help people a lot. Um, and, uh, and I already go, man, if we do this and we could probably do this and we could probably do that and do that. But what we were talking about today is like, okay, well, our first step is we just got to do the first thing, you know, like we just got to start and then do the first thing. And, um, and I just enjoy, I just enjoy the process. Like I, I just enjoy the, there's a crazy far off thing that I'd like to do. And let's just start chasing down the path and see if we can do that. And then you do that one and you do the next thing and do the next thing. So it's just, it's part of like the joy of life of something you don't know, something you don't know how to do and trying to figure that out. You know, like that's just such a, there's such a joyful process. The process of learning, I think to me is just what keeps me going, you know? Hmm. You make a great point, by the way, about that thing. Like I'm such an idiot, right? Uh, like, could you imagine if you said that to somebody else? Yeah. Like the person, you're such an idiot. Give me that. Let me do it. Like, they'd be like, what? And if you did that enough times, mm -hmm. you'd probably either totally destroy them or they would just leave. Yeah. They wouldn't be there anymore. But it's so common that we say that sort of thing to ourselves, whether it's out loud or even just in our heads. Yeah. It's like, there's this, always a person whispering in your ear kind of thing. Yeah. And it's like, what are you saying to yourself here? Yeah. You know, and that can be really destructive and it's a lot like somebody saying it to you. Yep. So to be aware of that is, is smart and helpful and I think we could probably all use that because I think in our heads we say things to ourselves we would never say to another person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, and, a, a term for people that have never really thought about that or like they're new to the process, I love what Zig Ziglar, who was a motivational speaker, like you know, just charming guy. Like you just love hearing him tell his stories, but he used, he calls it stinking thinking. And he's got like a thick Southern accent. Uh, he's, he's, you know, since passed away, but like you can find some really cool stories on YouTube where he tells stories, but he calls it uh, quit the stinking thinking. And so like we tell that to our kids all the time and, you know, they're at a great age where they're like doing gymnastics and they're doing choir and they're starting to create music and they're playing baseball and they're doing things that, uh, there are achievements associated with, you know, like learning a new skill or whatever it is. And um, we'll catch them being like, oh, I can't do that. And you're like, quit the stinking thinking, you know? So that's like, if you're new to this, like that's an easy, just kind of cheeky term to apply to that, that you can tell yourself, tell someone you're like working through this with that you're like, just quit the stinking thinking. Like hmm. you, you're better than that. You really don't believe that about yourself. You know, that's a, that's a cute little way to remember that that's helpful yeah. for us. That encapsulates the whole concept in a nice little rhyme. That's right, that's right. <clears throat> that's important to have like little, I mean, that's why we have language. Yep. So each word is like a symbol for some concept really. So it's nice to have this whole long winded thing about like the voice in your head because sometimes you need to just stop it. Okay. Yeah, that's right, that's exactly right. You mentioned like iterating things too. And, and I, again, I think that's great advice as well. Um, and I've seen this in myself specifically with the podcast. Mm. I wanted to do the podcast for like years before I started it. And I kept thinking, oh, it's going to be this thing and I'm going to do this. It'll have segments. It'll have like, there'll be like a tutorial. It'll be a sound design section. <laughs> and I'll make music for each part. And I was really excited about it. But it got so big that I was terrified of it too. It's like, where do I even start with this thing? Yeah. And it just sort of sat in my notebooks and little to-do lists and things until one day where I just went to the bare minimum. How, mm -hmm. What can I get done to do this? And it was just turn on a microphone and um, that worked. Yeah. And then, you know, for a long time, I didn't even have like an intro song or anything. Even still, I change it all the time. There's not really a theme. So yeah, there's, so what, you know, who cares? And here we are like 300 something episodes in that it's, if you don't just get going, yeah. you know, like, cause that momentum is really powerful. Yep. That you can, once you get it going, you know, like I think probably the same for you. If you would have waited until you had the perfect like video studio to start yeah. your channel, like who knows if that would have ever got started. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I told this story. I think it's saved on my Instagram account. I, as I talk for a second, I'm going to check just to 
point people to a specific place to like see this, but um, you, you can see this this progression happen. Uh, yeah, so like if you go to my Instagram from studio to stage IG and look at the, I mean, I'm like an old dude, so I don't know what it's called, but the little circles where you like save stories or whatever, I guess it's called save stories. <clears throat> but I have one called done is better than perfect. And um, mm -hmm. because that's been, that's been like a, you know, you talked about like language is such a great technology, but one of my favorite forms of that technology is just little sayings like mantras or whatever quotes that you can just easily repeat and live by and i think done is better than perfect is one i always try to go back to but you can see this and i tell this in the story where um two years ago or no a year ago now <laughs> i committed to do a youtube video every single day and part of it for me was um my head is just full of ideas and I want to die empty. Like I want to die, you know, every piece of knowledge I have, I want to try to share. Um, and there were just all these thoughts and questions people would ask. And I'm like, oh, I have a video on that. And then I'm like, wait, I don't, but it's in my head, but I can create a video. So mm. I just committed, like, I'm just going to record um, a video every day. And, and I missed, you know, I think in total, I didn't hit every single day, but um, <clears throat> pretty consistently seven videos a week. And, um, when you go back and look at the progression, the very first video, uh, I had the same video switcher I'm using now, but I had a different mic. And I had this weird setup where I had plugged it in and I, uh, it was during Christmas and my parents were in town visiting. And, um, and so I was like, hey, I gotta go away and record some stuff because I like made this commitment and I've gotta actually be able to do it. And um, so I went in like our little closet at my house that uh, I think at that time my wife helped me like decorate, which was really great and looked awesome. But I did the very first video. And when you go back and listen to it, because of the way I had my mic set up, there's this weird like phasing thing where it basically took like a mono source and did like dual mono, but it was kind of phasing. So it almost sounded like chorus. And, um, and, and that was like, I don't know, maybe the first seven, 14 videos I did. I don't, I don't know how many were like that. Um, but I, I was like, they're done and I've got to get them out. And so I released them. And I think I was listening through my computer speaker, so I didn't really notice how terrible it was until mm. someone started commenting. And I was like, what are they talking about? And what was really interesting is, um, you know, people's comments are like, that effect is awful. Like, I'm not going to watch any of your videos because blah, blah, blah. And, um, and it was interesting because I went back and I listened, and my first response is, I need to take them all down. Then I was like, no, I'm going to leave them up because, I mean, something that I talk to my students about something, I talk to my kids about something, I talk to myself about is done is better than perfect. And I thought, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to iterate. And so then I figured out how to fix that problem. And then got a little better at it, an extra camera angle. And then we sold our house in Texas and we moved and I had to find a way to record on the road. So I took a picture of my office and uh, put a green screen up and recorded with a green screen for a little bit. And then people were like, yeah, you're, we can tell you got a green screen. It's awful, man. And I'm like, yeah, but you can't tell that I moved and sold my house and I'm recording these at a friend's house in Florida for a month while the kids are screaming out in the pool, which you can't hear that on a few of the videos. But I like did that to then get to the new place here. And I'm like, I've got to create content. And the only lens I had was way too close. And so you just see this progression even in the content of like, okay, that, that's pretty awful. Oh, he got a little better. Oh, he took a little dip. Oh, okay, but he got better and then he got better and got better. And it's not necessarily some external person looking at me and saying, oh, he got better, but just me going, I've improved. Like, you know, it's that 1% improvement. I'm 1% better on this video than I'm in the next video. And, and like a perfect example for me is uh, when I started all those videos and everything Previous to that, I never had an outline. I never had a script. Like I can't record with a script. I turn into just like uh, I turn into uh, Ron Burgundy if I have a script, and it just it's really really bad. Um, but I never had a script, and that would turn into videos that ran on way too long, much like me answering your question now. But I would like miss the point, and I would miss key things. And like now, I mean, I have a couple pieces of paper here uh, where things are outlined, and I'm like working on okay, what's the story I'm going to tell? How am I going to build the tension to say, like, instead of just answering your problem, I'm going to show you why it's a problem and why this solution isn't the way and then answer it. And then a literal, um, I mean, I think it's three pages of comments from YouTube videos that I've done where I go, okay, next time I do that video, I'm going to answer 
uh, this guy's question specifically. Like, yeah, he maybe could have been a little nicer in the way he posted it, but <laughs> I have his question here and the next piece of content I create will directly answer this guy's question. Um, and that's improvement to me. Like, But again, I, I, I wouldn't be at this point if I waited till I got to this point to start, you know? Like, it was starting that then eventually got me to the point where I have lighting, the camera, everything kind of dialed in, you know, pretty good to like get comfortable enough to do the reps to get to this point. So done is better than perfect. That's a big one for me. Yeah, that's great. And it you find out those mistakes by doing it. You that's realize, right. oh, I got a phasing issue. Oh, I need yeah. a better camera. Oh, I need the background needs to be cleaner or whatever. Yeah. I need to start having some notes. You don't know what those problems are going to be yeah. until you're going, yeah. until you start doing it. It's just so true for so many things, I mm. guess. Um, and the temptation could be to like, well, first I got to buy everything. Yeah. But then you you have all this stuff to learn how to use now. Yeah. So if, if you're doing music production, you decide I'm going to buy every plug and I can ever possibly need. Now you got a hundred times the amount of things to learn than yeah. you would have if you would have just started on something simple. Yep. <clears throat> It's going to make it so much harder. It's going to suck a lot of the fun out of it because you're going to feel inept in that. It's just, uh, this. This is the moving. This is the perfect podcast, I think, to talk about this because um, the the whole all of marketing for every music manufacturer, the story they're trying to get you to believe is you cannot create music or the music that you want to create until you buy our thing, and. You, you can say, okay, there's a lot of reasons why that's wrong, but I think ultimately it goes back to, and I think I mentioned this earlier, that aspirational identity, which is like, I, I aspire to be a successful producer and a, <clears throat> a really great marketing person at a company will tell enough stories of successful, you know, uh, this person mixed this song with this plugin and then suddenly the sales of that plugin take off, not because people want that plugin, but because people want what they believe that plugin will get them. And there's incredible freedom when you realize like there's no keyboard, there's no interface. I mean, we started this before we recorded talking about a really amazing piece of gear that's coming out that we can't talk about um, that is amazing. But that piece of gear isn't going to be the thing that suddenly allows you to record your songs or write music or write better music. It's a tool and it's a thing that maybe removes some friction, uh, which I think it will. And, 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 you know, this plugin may help you EQ your vocals better. And yes, this, this one plugin may help you like level the, the, the levels of your, your song better and master a song better and make the end product better. But you don't have to have that thing. That thing's not going to make you write better songs, you know? And mm -hmm. that's something I believe that um, it's, it's so easy in an Instagram TikTok world to just flip and see. That's why, like, when you watch producers, producers um, don't just like play their song or screen share their song. What do they share? They they share a immaculate studio full of synthesizers. I mean, even you and I, like, your setup looks freaking amazing, and it'll be really easy for me to be like, oh, I, I've got to get that profit to 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 be able to create music, you know? Not realizing I've got Ableton Live Suite that has every type of synth sound. I could want to create, but I can use, I can use the the hope or desire of gear to keep me from creating. Sometimes as an excuse, you know, like to avoid the pain that my song may not be great. Um, but like, we don't need a new plugin. We don't need a new piece of gear. We just gotta start. We gotta just get the reps in and just do it. You know. It's so true. And if you were to look at the stuff behind me and the plugins in my computer. When I'm actually doing work, when I'm actually moving forward and mm. getting stuff done, it's like criminally underused. It, it gets a, a few minutes here or there, maybe. Yeah. And that's it. It's so fast. And it, like you said, it really, especially in a mix, it could have been anything. Yeah. It yep. really could have been. Um, and I've probably, guess I could say, I've been fortunate enough to have had that feeling of that this thing is gonna help me make my hits. I've had that fall through enough times where I don't really buy it anymore. Mm. And I mean, there's other clever ways that we get pulled into it. It might be a limited time sale or something like that. Yeah. 
Um, but I've done, I've fallen for that enough times where I get something that's on sale that I think I'm going to use one day, mm. and I don't ever really use it. Yeah. And I'd probably save a lot more money if I just bought everything at full price, but only when I needed it. Yeah, that's really good. Like, well, there's all these sales going on. It's Black Friday, so I'm going to stock up and spend. Yeah ungodly amounts of money that I don't have on all this stuff because it seems like the smart thing to do. But, and then again, and then that just gives you so many more options to sift through yeah. and then stuff you have to learn. It's, uh, it's no wonder that that's such a challenge everybody has. Yeah. We all face this, like we, we're stuck, we're paralyzed, we don't know what to do, we can't finish things. It's painful. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> That's really good. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you a little bit about kind of one of your videos recently too. Um, Cause you're, you come from like a band background, which I do too. Um, you said playing guitar, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe as a guitar player, and we kind of talked about this too, how just even Ableton Live itself is seen by so many people as being for like EDM or something electronic anyway. Yeah. Whereas a lot of my friends that are like rock musicians, guitarists, I, I sort of need to convince them like, no, you can still do that stuff inside a live. It's the same thing. It's yeah. just, it also has these other things that work well for particular genres. Um, <clears throat> you made a video recently about playing a live show, how to use backing tracks without cheating, I think it was called. Or, yep. Uh, yep. Is it, was it cheating? Was that the word you used? I think it was cheating. Uh, we may have been A-B testing some titles, but cheating was definitely one of the options, yeah. Okay. I'm curious um, where you think the line is for cheating. Yeah. What, do you have a line? I mean, because obviously this is all subjective and um, kind of a, a moot point in my opinion in yeah. a lot of ways, but I'm kind of curious because this is, it's always a fun talk and I get into this with the Berkeley class too on our live performance. You know, it's, it's how far do you want to go? What do you want to do? Yeah. But do you have a point where you're like, all right, that's kind of, that's cheating. That's cheap. That's unfair. Yeah. I think, um, let me talk me personally and then let me, let, let's talk about like, I think, <clears throat> Maybe something collectively we can all agree on similar terms, like to move forward, if that makes sense. So, sure, yeah. I, for me I personally, <laughs> anytime someone is on stage faking something that's actually coming from a track, to me, that's crossing a line. And in that in that podcast episode, I share that you know um, there are times where, and I think that's important distinction. Maybe if I even pause before I go further. Because if you're um, if you're new to the idea of live performance, you've never performed on a stage, um, or you're new to like, hey, I'm I'm into performance, but I'm into like live looping artists, uh, and that's what I want to do with Ableton. And backing tracks is just cheating, and it's for non musicians. Um, sometimes it's really easy to think what backing tracks are is someone pressing spacebar. And everything on stage is just people faking it, right? And we see the Ashley Simpson SNL thing. Uh, we see Millie Vanilli, if you're old enough to remember that. Uh, Mariah Carey at New Year's Eve, I think was the kind of maybe most recent one. But you you see these horror stories of people like being found out that they're faking it on stage. Um, and so sometimes we think backing tracks basically means um, uh, musicians on stage with an instrument not really plugged in and they're just faking it kind of thing. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's important to note there are some people that do that. Like any major pop act that you go to is probably fake singing at some point in the song, if not the majority of the set. And we could argue whether that's real music, whether that's good or not. Um, but there's also, I guess, similar arguments to say, well, why would I go to a venue? Why would I pay money, go to a venue with 30,000 people to listen to a DJ press play? And it's like, okay, great, they can filter sweep, but like, I could just sit at home and listen to a CD. So it's like, there could be some similar arguments there, but I think it's just important for people to understand that the majority of the time that people use backing tracks, they're using sounds and things to enhance what's on stage and to take the way I always think of it, it's 
as an artist, you have a particular sound in your head. You go into the studio and you have unlimited, I mean, we talked about the sense that you have. You, you have every tool imaginable to create, to go around and sample different sounds, to walk outside with a microphone, to capture the sound of the wind, like whatever it is, you have so many tools available to you in the studio. When you step on the stage, not all those tools are accessible to you and not all those tools um, are available to be achieved at a price that's reasonable for you to pay, for you to then charge people to make back what you're making, to make enough to keep doing the same thing. In the sense of, you could say, well, it's cheating to have a band on stage and to hear a shaker tambourine coming through and no one's on stage playing the shaker and tambourine. They should have a percussionist on stage. And particularly if you're a percussionist who gets paid to play percussion, you're going, yes, that is cheating. You should hire me to play percussion. But if you don't have the means to go and hire a percussionist to go out on the road with you, then that's a way to achieve the same thing within your budget constraints. Um, so the idea of cheating, like first, let's just say what backing tracks isn't most of the time is it's not people on stage faking what you hear in the track. Often it's supplementing. You know, I like U2 is, is to me like the token example of a rock band, three piece, but they have this massive sound. You hear these keys sounds coming from different places. You hear percussion things coming from different places. And it's, it's. I think I said three piece, but it's four piece. But it's like, you know, it's just- Three instruments though. Yeah, three instruments. Yeah, that's right. Occasionally Bono plays electric or Edge goes and plays keys. But they have this massive sound and that's because they're using tracks. And you could say, well, like they're cheating. and. Again, if that's your thing, that's your thing. Just you do it a different way, and we'll all be friends and get along. But um, they're using things to enhance what's on stage, right? Um, and so the whole idea of using backing tracks without cheating, I think, and I think maybe the initial title of that I had was like, how to do it without feeling like a fraud, which is more of, I think fraud is more of an internal thing. Cheating is more of someone being like, you're cheating. Um, and the fraud thing is like, if you have an idea in your head where you want to start a song with, um, and I don't know if I told the story in uh, in that episode or not, but like, if if you're writing a song in response to like some social issue, and there's some clip from the news or some clip from a politician that drives home the corruption of this person, or there's something that that everyone collectively would know, like when you play that. People are going to hear that and instantly go, that's wrong. And you're writing about that. What better way to like get people in the right emotional state than to start your song or in the middle of the song, the whole band drops out, the lights go out, you see that video clip, you hear the audio, and then the band like perfectly hits right at the right times. And you're using all these other elements. You're using synthesizers not to play parts, but to create emotions. And to me, that's where... That's where backing tracks becomes really fun, is the goal is, I always say good production is, is, is not noticed, it's not seen, it's felt, it's experienced. And so we've all walked away from shows where we're like, man, like I don't really know what happened there, but that was just incredible. Like the, the sound that they had, it was, I can't pinpoint exactly what was happening, just the sound was unbelievable. Um, and so I think, backing tracks and playing with click and having these auxiliary extra sounds that's um again like that's a tool that we can use to pull from to get what's in our head to kind of tell our story and our, share our experience on stage which i think is really helpful and I always try to remind people two other thoughts whenever this comes up <clears throat> is one there's the thought of well real musicians don't use tracks and every single example that people give me someone was like yeah well this guy doesn't use click and I'm like, he does. I know the guy who is the playback tech for him on the road. And guess what? He also is not singing live, but it's done so well that you think that that person is like the model artist to, to you know, look up to. Um, but I know amazing, amazing musicians who their music musicianship is not diminished because they're playing with a click or there's a shaker in the track or there's a synth part in the track. They're just amazing musicians who are happy to use a particular tool to help enhance what they're doing. And, and then the other thing that I think is really important in this conversation is context. And um, I had a very, very, very early on episode of Behind the Space Bar where I just talked about how context is king. And I always tell, I tell the same story, so if you've heard it before, I apologize. But one of my favorite concerts of all time, uh, one of my favorite guitar players of all time, John Pizzarelli, 
my wife and I were in Florida. We went to go see him and his trio um, uh, in Jupiter, Florida. And it's just him playing classic standards. If you never heard John play, just amazing. Incredible vocalist, incredible entertainer, amazing guitar player, Freddie Green kind of style comping stuff. Just amazing, really, really good. So we we uh, go to see John Pizzarelli. I love the show, but I always think of, um, I'm the guy that teaches people how to use tracks on stage. And I honestly probably would have, you know, stood up in the theater and yelled like the first time people heard Stravinsky's whatever the thing was, where it had the like tritone chords where everyone's like yelling and screaming, whatever that symphony is, I'm forgetting now. <laughs> but um, I, I, I probably would have revolted and like walked out and asked for my money back if I walked in and John was like, hey, this is called uh, Just the Way You Are. And he starts like playing and it's like from a drum machine and he's got backing tracks going. I'm like, no, the context does not necessitate him using tracks. And that would actually diminish the value of what he's presenting. Whereas I can't then go walk into a U2 show and say that the tracks are diminishing the experience that, you know, Bono and The Edge and the rest of the band are creating. Like, it's part of their context. It fits that context. It does not fit this context. So, and then the final thing, I, again, sorry, I talk forever, but I just always remind people, like, if that's not your thing, just don't use it. Just don't do it. Like, if you, if, if even hearing all those things, you still are like, yeah, man, I just can't do backing tracks. Just just don't make it your thing. That's perfectly, perfectly mm -hmm. fine. Um, to me, I think it's a thing to consider if serving the audience is above serving yourself. And that sounds like a lofty goal and like, oh, I feel better about myself when I say that. But um, I think often there's things we should do that will better serve the audience and give them a better experience because... 95% of the audience that can't even tell if you're using tracks. Like, yeah, if they hear a full drum set and there's no drummer on stage, they'll go, huh. But you, again, you'll see a three-piece live and you hear a full string section. 95% of the audience, not because they're dumb, but because they're in the experience. They're not up there going, what, where is that coming from? Like, they don't care whether you're live looping or you press space bar and you're like, you know, maybe recording a couple's parts. To them, it's just the experience of what's happening provides the value to them mm. that, that's a great answer and it's nuanced of course which is why i asked you the question because i figure you had a a very because it's an interesting background to come from and then to be doing this sort of stuff because i think a lot of us that are probably from like rock band backgrounds we do appreciate the looseness of a band that's just playing yeah um there's something nice about that. And then when you put the click on and if you put backing tracks, sometimes it does, it can create, I should say, a sort of eerie feeling where there have been shows I'm at and I'm like, I just don't know what I'm hearing anymore. Yeah. Like when I get that feeling, I, I have a hard time enjoying it. Mm. When it's like, I see th there's a few things on here, but I know I hear stuff that isn't in there. And now I can't even tell if they're actually playing anymore. Yeah. So then I get unsettled. Hmm. But if it's something where it's clear that, yes, we've got this other stuff going on and there's people playing along with it, I, it doesn't affect me that same way. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's fine and it's enjoyable. And then it's an interesting display of, um, you know, just technology and what's possible yeah. and how we can it's it's amazing what we can have now in a live show mm -hmm. um and i think you're right it, it the context is extremely important um what you're kind of putting out there for the people if you're putting out this like raw punk rock band thing then it might not fit that context yeah you know and if you're but the pop performance at the super bowl you know, where that's a much different type of thing, then I get it. Yeah. It makes sense. And I'll mention just, <clears throat> just to like uh, back up maybe something I said there, like the Super Bowl to me is crossing the line just because it's all pre recorded. Like if, if people didn't know that, all the music is pre recorded beforehand in a studio. And that's just because of the limitations. That's why Flea, all those years ago, like had his, his uh, quarter inch cable plugged into his bass and like clearly cut. Cause I think it was kind of his way of being like, just F it. Like, I'm just, I, I don't even care. Like, I'm just gonna show everyone that we're clearly not, you know, they were playing, but it was all pre track stuff. But that's, that's like a very isolated context where you, you take 
um, the same band that that you know that played at the Super Bowl and go see them live. They're not doing they're doing the same music, but they are playing it live. But like you said, they're using those other elements to to add in to enhance to get the point across, tell the story. Um, but you said Super Bowl, and I was like, oh, I want to clarify. That is one of those scenarios again yeah. to me. But there are again there are pop shows on the road touring where it's more about the band having the right look as opposed to the band actually being a really good band that kind of can fit the fit the the bill and then you just press play on Spacebar and uh, <clears throat> they're the two most important people in the venue then are the artists and the playback tech. You know, it's not the band on stage. So, and I don't personally find joy in that music, but some people do and sells out stadiums and um, some might say they're even successful people. So there you have it. Hmm. Successful, eh? <laughs> Bringing it back up to where we well, started. There are so many cases too where, I mean, maybe the show is more about like dancing. Yeah. And theatrics too. Yeah. So um, then, you know, you don't even mind if there's lip syncing going on or any of that kind of stuff because you're, you're seeing more than that. You're, yeah. You're, coming for more of a spectacle than, yeah. than a nerdy guy like me that's like, what's going on on stage? What's right? happening here? Yeah. And I'm right, you know, barely in the moment. I, I have a funny, I think this is like some weird contradiction that I haven't worked out in myself um, where, so with like our band, we had the choice and we decided we're, we're not doing any of that stuff. We just want to play and just kind of natural. And that was nice for me. Mm in that um, I've been doing a lot of live performance, Ableton Live stuff, and it's just me with some MIDI controllers and a microphone. So going just to like, kind of like riding off the rails is fun yeah. and exciting. And uh, I don't think our songs really would lend to that too well anyway. But in the live performance stuff, I experimented with like bringing my guitar into it mm. and that didn't feel right to me. Yeah. That felt less authentic than no guitar and just, you know, pressing my buttons, turning my mm -hmm. knobs and singing into a microphone. Because it was like it was like a showboat thing in a way. It was like, well, I play guitar too, everybody. Like, here we go. And and I felt like the music suffered, the performance was weaker. And now it's just like this guy standing there playing his guitar. Yeah. Um, which is funny because it's that was like an actual technical instrument, you know, to play. Yeah. But it felt like a less authentic performance. Yeah. Whereas the the controllerism aspect of it was like kind of fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just a funny, weird thing that you so and I've seen people do that very well. You know, I think of like cloud quiet well, that really well. It's yeah. it's funny as you were talking, I was gonna say, <laughs> again, it all goes back to context because as you were saying that, I get it. But then I think of Derek and dude, yeah. Cloud Chord, He, it's like, it's it's just it's perfect. Like in every every way, because it's like perfectly live looping. It's this perfect lo-fi chill hop, like uh, jazz guitar, like killer chops. Um, but then he's like, a lot of it is is tracks, quote unquote tracks. But it's like, man, is he freaking entertaining to watch? And whether it's on a YouTube video or watching him live, um, thankfully in Austin, we did a couple of certified trainer events. And every time Derek would grab his guitar and just play songs, like <clears throat> it was amazing because you would just watch the entire audience of people just like enamored. And they're like, this guy's a, you know, is is his guitar playing being diminished because he's playing through Ableton? He's using effects on his guitar, or he's playing with tracks? No way, man! Like no one in that room has the chops, a quarter of the chops that Derek has. And you like, it's just it's just amazing. But then again, like you said, in the context of what you're doing and and how it, you feel about it, again, it, if it doesn't work, like it doesn't work. Stick to that particular context. So yeah, that's. Gosh, that's a huge piece of it. It's so big. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm not in the same universe as him as a guitar player. Yeah, you know, he's somewhere else. Yeah, for else. sure. But, but I don't even think that's the real reason why. It's just, uh, the, it's just his thing, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's centered around that. Maybe mine was less centered around that kind of hmm. thing. 
But it felt like just a funny surprise to me. Like, isn't that weird? You know, that it's as much as I appreciate that kind of stuff where it's like people playing instruments or, or even like off the grid kind of stuff. It's, it just didn't work. And it felt like, it felt more <laughs> like weird and awkward and put on fabricated mm. when I was actually playing an instrument. That's interesting. I never found the balance for myself. That's interesting. Have you ever done any, um, you know, speaking of like going off the rails a little bit, have you experimented much with some of the features in live where the tempo can follow mm -hmm. um, like a drummer or something? Because there's a feature in there now, if people aren't familiar, um, I, th I think it's just called follow, right? Yeah. Where you can have some sort of external input guiding the metronome and the grid and everything will go along with that. And I've, I've only kind of done it um, as experiments to see if it worked and it mm. seemed like it was working a little bit on my own. But um, do you have any shows, have you had anyone that you're aware of that uses that where maybe the drummer is controlling the, the click and the tempo based on live listening to them? Yeah, that's a good question. I personally, again, I can only speak from my own context experience and experience with students. I personally don't know of anyone that is using it uh, has used it successfully live. And I think there's two, <clears throat> there's two considerations when we talk about it. One is just the purely technical, does it work? And I've had moderate success with it working. It really depends on the context and ambient noise around it and what it's being picked up and how constant the rhythm is, you know, kind of thing. So there's the technical aspect of it. And then two, I think there's the, the what do you call it? artistic aspect of it, if you will, of like a song that was recorded at 80 BPM doesn't necessarily feel better because someone played it without click and it's like wavering. You know, like there definitely is, like you said, one of my favorite experiences is just being on stage with a group of people, just playing music and just interacting and responding and responding to the drummer, even just the, the slight nuances is like how they build on their toms and me palm muting a little less every single time to build dynamically with them. Like I love those little nuances, but sometimes people say, oh, I want to check out the tempo following stuff, or I want to find a way to use tracks live without a click because click feels restrictive. And I'm like, well, if your song was recorded at 80 BPM and you have a lot of tracks, I don't think it's going to serve you or the audience better for you to play that at a varying tempo. But if, if it's the type of Again, you, it goes back to context. If it's a type of context where um, it should flow and it should be very expressive, and it's more of it's more of you like using sounds in Ableton to enhance what you're doing um, in a more I mean I don't know the better way to say it, a more like performing way than just mm. a backing track. Um, I could see how that could be beneficial, but again, long answer to a simple question. I personally have not seen a lot of people, I, I haven't seen anyone use that uh, feature successfully in a live context. Um, I could see like in a studio context how that would be beneficial. And I certainly, goodness, I mean, this isn't the feature you started asking about, but like capture to me, I was very hesitant about capture at first because I'm like, I am a real musician who can play in time with the metronome. And then one day it dawned on me that I was like working out a part and I'm like, oh, I don't have to go record that part. It was recorded and I just hit capture and there was a piano line I was working on. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's why it exists, you know? So, um, but yeah, I, I personally, uh, I've had moderate success with it working from a technical perspective and I have not seen anybody use it live. Again, not saying it's not used live and it can't be used live. I just have not seen it used live uh, in that context. Hmm. Well, it's, it's risky. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, and the the thing about live concerts often is the risk is part of the fun, mm. but that's a risk that can really go wrong. Yeah, <laughs> you know where where if I mess up my guitar part, I can jump back in. I know where the beats are, and I. But if you do something where now the backing tracks and the timing is all off, like you can't just sort of sync it back naturally based on how it feels. You know, while you're performing on an instrument. And can I ask you a question, it's Brian? An interesting idea. Yeah. So, kind of in the yeah, same sure. context, and this is a thought I'm like trying to process and work out. But 
Have you done a lot of like um, live looping? I don't know why I'm quoting everything, but have you done a lot of like mm. plug your guitar in and record guitar live or record MIDI parts live kind of performance with, with Ableton? Very little. Um, so I might do it kind of to like start something out. Okay. You know, I might like build something slowly and put it together. Um, and that's cool. But the problem that I have after that is now I have to then what, build the next part yeah. from scratch and yeah. start over. And then every single time I'm going to switch sections, I need to build it. And every song has to start off with me going like, doom, 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 yeah. doom you know, on a kick. And yeah. um, if it starts to feel like a gimmick fest. Mm. But yeah. I've done it in like, maybe like interlude parts, you know, where start building something atmospheric or maybe even to like intro a song where then I have my, I always did it in session view. So mm -hmm. I'd have like my clips ready to go. So I might build a little jam that's like kind of in the key mm -hmm. and then transition that into the first verse or something. But um, the kind of like building it from scratch thing, um, every time especially no because it just started to feel like okay here i go again i'm gonna do another one yeah and the performance and the experience to me for what i was doing i felt suffered yeah it's it's interesting because i've been thinking a lot <clears throat> again we we talked about like you were asking me how'd you like this niche how did you choose the niche of performing on stage with ableton or backing tracks and I had an epiphany, again, context is everything. And I, I think I told this story in an episode where um, I did a video that was like best interfaces for live performance. And in it, I said, um, if you're using an uh, interface with uh, uh, Ableton Live on stage, you don't need inputs. Like we're, we're sending audio out of Ableton, you don't need inputs. And, uh, and I said that just very frank and I just said that very definitively because in my mind I was speaking to a community of people that are using Ableton primarily for backing tracks. And mm. um, you don't need inputs. You're looking just primarily for as many outputs as possible because you're pressing play in Ableton and passing audio from Ableton. You know, all your inner mixing, your cue mixing is done by the monitor console, front of houses, uh, you know, soundboard is mixing, you know, that. Um, <clears throat> and I had, there's one comment in particular I remember um, that this girl said, um, uh, she, she was an artist and she commented, it was, it was like nice, it wasn't a rude comment, but she just commented and said, you know, what do you mean I don't need inputs? Uh, we have four singers on stage, what are we supposed to do with that? It's kind of rough translation of the, of the comment. And it, it just, it made me realize that when I say performing on stage with Ableton Live, that you either come at that, I mean, from lots of different perspectives, but the two main I think of is live looping now and this like backing tracks thing. And, and they're kind of alternate universes in a, in a lot of ways, you know? Like backing tracks is typically used with a band on stage. Live looping is typically a solo process. It's one person. And a lot of the, you know, the, the skills and knowledge you need to live loop to, to either use looper or to primarily or probably record clips in session view and trigger clips in session view with a push or uh, with an APC or with a launch pad or whatever, is a different set of skills than building a set in Ableton Live, in Arrangement View, working on your transitions to use backing tracks. And so I, something that just keeps rolling around in my mind is like, I almost, I, I wanna come up with like a performance personality type test to like help people decide that have not performed on stage, should I go the route of live lo looping or should I go the route of backing tracks? And, and primarily thinking more of like solo artists because I think, because you, you nailed it exactly. I think it's really easy to see people who are amazing at live looping. Rachel Collier, uh, Elise Traub, like uh, even Ed Sheeran, you know, um, you, you see these people that do build songs section by section and it's highly, highly entertaining. And I think it's really easy for us to just be interested in the technical bit of that, which is like, how does Rachel mix her in-ears? How does she set up and record her instrument? And how do you record in clips and use uh, the IEC driver to jump to the next scene? Or how do we use Looper properly? And so I think the technical aspect of live looping is really interesting, but I think a lot of us will end up using that as a gimmick 
and could potentially, and I, I want to be careful to, like, I'm tempted not to say this, but I'm going to say it and hopefully everyone will forgive me. I think some of us will bore an audience for our own personal satisfaction of being like, look how difficult it was for me to do what I did with live looping, where maybe we would have better entertained an audience if we it was just us and acoustic guitar, or it was us with some like supplemental backing track type things. And again, I, I, I want to be super clear. I'm not saying the people that are really good at live looping are doing that for their own personal satisfaction, because what we miss is the art and the art of performance that it takes to like take a song that was like this and turn it like this and then record this and then add that, then add that, then add that to it. Um, and I think that's a big skill that it's easy to watch a technical tutorial on live looping and completely miss that like, <clears throat> again, there's such an element of performance in that that sometimes lends to the chaos of like, oh, are they gonna make it to the drum set in time to record the drums? Are they gonna whatever? Yeah. But I think just more of that is saying, how can I take a song that's very linear and translate it to a way that's not gonna bore the audience? Um, that, that maybe some of us should look at, again, just not a computer on stage or just for synths or just backing tracks. Um, you know, I don't know, that's just stuff I'm, I've been thinking a lot about really since that, that comment of going, Oh yeah, there is this whole other world of live looping that um, I don't particularly speak to right now. That I think, uh, you know, I clearly is performing, you know, also, but it's like it's almost like a different side of the brain. I think, you know. Yeah, yeah. I had to learn a lot of that stuff. I I use an interface with inputs, mm -hmm. um, and I run everything out of the computer, and I send a left and a right to the mixer from front of house. Yeah. Um, my vocals go in there. They run through effects and live. I have control over everything. The sound person just gets left and right. Mm -hmm. Whatever I have, they can turn the volume up and down. So they have no control over anything else. Yeah. Um, so I would need the inputs myself. Yeah. And in my, and I've gone through this too, where I listen to some of like the old recordings I did and I'm like, there's so many effects and glitchy mm. things and beat repeats and yada, yada. Every second I'm pushing a button and I started to realize like, I'm just trying to like show people that I'm doing something. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it was like, it didn't serve the music or the performance. Mm. It was more me being insecure because especially I was going to play with other rock bands mm. and I'm showing up with a laptop and buttons. Yeah. And you know, we're going back to like 2010, like before that was acceptable. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would show up there like, what are you doing, dubstep, bro? Like I get these comments from people, well, we got the DJ, what happened to the band? Like all these things. So I wanted to be sure that you knew I was doing something. Mm. And when I listened to it, I was like, but it's not serving it. It's yeah. not serving the music. That's really good. Um. And my songs also are made all in session view. So mm. there isn't an arrangement view version. Yeah. So they're kind of formed as like live jams that slowly start to become songs and I'm improvising on it and playing around with the arrangements and the vocals until I start getting a song out of it. Mm. But they exist in rows in mm. session view. And there's almost like not a set way that they go yet. Yeah. It's kind of backwards. It's more like I'm going stage to studio. Yeah. You know, so, because I've treated the live, my live performance set, it's an instrument that I'm playing. Mm. And I just happen to have like a drum here and some percussion and these are some instruments I can play and I got vocals on top of it. Yeah. So it, it kind of starts to come to life as these jams that I start to organize, organize when I'm playing. Um, And... That was fun, and that mm. that's where I think it. I got the performance feeling out of it, but it did really become obvious that I have to think about like I'm playing to an audience. Yeah. So. Yeah. Little things, um, like one in particular that sort of surprised me was I decided not to have a mic stand mm. and and actually hold the mic in my hand, which I I now only have one hand to push my buttons and turn my knobs. Mm. But I just found it was like a more like visceral thing with the performance. I could like get in there and like hold the mic out. You yeah. know, like I could use it as like a tool, like Steven Tyler dancing with a mic stand or something. Yeah. It was part of the the thing. Whereas if I would have had, say, like a headset or like a mic stand, 
I would have been much more stationary and just kind of, I would have been able to do more. Yeah. But I didn't think the performance was better. Hmm. The like what the audience is getting. Well, and I Again, think like there are people that do that, do the headset thing. Great. Yeah. Um, I, I had a podcast with Claire Daltrick. Yeah. You probably know her. So, uh, and we were kind of joking because she does the headset thing or she at least did at the time. And I was like, it didn't work for me. But for her, like, it has to be. Yeah. She's, and she's doing those things too. She's picking up basses and guitars and other instruments to play that stuff that just didn't work for me when I did it. Yeah. So I think, um, man, I, I feel like uh, for anyone listening to this, <clears throat> that is maybe more of the live looping camp and less of the backing track camp. Like, I, I really do feel like over the next, and I kind of teased this at the beginning of the year, but over the next six months to a year, like one of my goals will be to incorporate a little more live looping content. Like in particular, one of the things I've been talking a lot about is like vocal processing with the universal audio interface. And as opposed to what I would consider is the more classical approach of vocal processing, which is like at the soundboard, the audio engineer adds reverb to your mic. Um, you know, th that again, just for me, I'm kind of moving more towards like, Let's let's talk a little more about the solo performer too. So um, anyway, I was going to say, anyone listening to this that you're like, Will, I would love, because I think there's a benefit that I can bring to people that are doing live looping or solo artists from a more traditional, classical, not guitar or music style, but classically on stage approach of musicians and things that I've learned that I think if people that are solo artists, live looping artists can apply will be really beneficial. So I'm super interested, like anyone listening to this, that's like, well, I'd love for you to make a tutorial about this or have questions about it, or even want to share like a video of you performing live. Man, those things are so incredibly beneficial to me as I'm thinking of content and working on content. And I've been super fortunate that over the past couple months, I, I it must be something in the water, but probably half of the coaching calls I do are with solo artists and live looping artists. And here I am like backing track guys showing up. But what's been really, really cool is they have taken away things that they never would have learned just by being a solo individual on stage without having someone with an experience doing this from a band to be able to say, hey, well, let's just think about what happens if your laptop goes down. And they're like, oh, I've never thought about that. And I'm like, well, there's there's things I've learned by using tracks with a band of how to create redundancy and how to apply division of labor to create a rig that's going to be rock solid for you. So that, yes, it may be a little extra gear, but you can walk into any venue and know like the show will go on because I bought this extra piece of gear. So anyway, I've just, as people listening to this that are in that world, you know, send me content, send me videos you're performing, send me ideas for tutorials you have, because um, that's definitely a space I want to learn more about, speak more about. And um, all the live looping I've done has been with my acoustic and a DL4, and then doing like ambient guitar live looping, which is probably the gateway drug for guitar players to get into Ableton. Is like, oh, what if I yeah. plug my guitar in and do like a Brian Eno, you know, guitar-y thing? And, oh, I can live loop. And then the rest is history, you know. Mm hmm yeah that's cool i i would enjoy that kind of material um there's a lot to learn i mean <laughs> if my computer went down i was out of luck yeah i was just it yeah was, and everything the mic would be out that like you would just have silence from me on stage yeah and i've had to learn you know lessons um the uh i was using the original apc 40 it had the mm. crossfader on the bottom yeah and right under the crossfader is play, record, stop. Oh, gosh. And I used that for like, I created like a sort of scratching effect. Oh, cool. Using a, a ping pong delay with uh, the repitch mode. Yeah. Had it set up in a way where it kind of like, you know, and I could play around my voice and instruments that way. But one night I just was doing that and I hit stop. Oh, no. <laughs> just right under my finger. Yeah. And I was like, then that's it. It's just like, it's not like even like, when you hit stop, um, you know, if you should stop playing guitar, it, yeah. the reverb or the drum, the cymbal rings, it's just done. It's just Everything's all. gone, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoops, you whoops. know. I think uh, luckily the crowd was uh, inebriated enough to not really pick up or care too much. Yeah. But 
And I just like started playing the next song. Just That's good. Moved on. Alcohol but, is the plugin we all need. It makes all our songs sound better. <laughs> yeah. And that's like a, a thing to think about too in live performances. What do you, what do you do when things go wrong? Like mm. They will go wrong. I mean, yeah. I've played with bands, like they break a string and then they throw fits or yeah. like something goes wrong and it gets really weird for the audience. It's yeah. tense and uncomfortable. But um, I think some tact there, laugh about it, make mm -hmm. a joke or something, it, it can... That's the kind of stuff where, like, you see a show and like something like that happens, and you're like, "Oh yeah, that was a show," and they, you know, they messed that up, but yeah. they made that joke. Like, those are like kind of the. It can it can easily go from like disaster and oh my god, to like endearing. It's endearing, like, yeah. Hey, that, that's the fun thing about seeing a show is you never know. Yeah, things can go wrong. And I think I think like something I talk about all the time. Uh, okay, and here's another phrase: hope is not a good backup plan. And um, I was going on hope. <laughs> yeah. And I say that, and I think sometimes think like, well, gosh, that guy's life must be miserable. Like it must be overscheduled and everything is blah, blah, blah. But what's interesting is that's not who I am. Like I am spontaneous. Like uh, if you walk downstairs to, uh, to my bedroom, me, my wife, and each of our kids have our own backpacks that are basically packed at all times. Um, like I, I live the lifestyle of a prepper in that sense so that we could be spontaneous and go on trips and like almost at a moment's notice get up and leave because uh, I am, a good friend of mine described me really well one time. He's like, you like order, but you always want things to be a little scrappy. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good way to put it. And so like to me, hope is not a good backup plan or or thinking about like something people often fuss at me about is they'll say, um, which again, let's talk about your story. Like you're processing your vocal. Uh, maybe you're doing some, some recording. You've got, you know, sense that you're playing. Maybe you've got some tracks loaded in there. What I would always tell people is, okay, division of labor is this concept of let's, let's devote one thing to each task. So a computer dedicated to tracks, a computer dedicated to keys, computer dedicated to vocal processing, so that if one of those were to go down, the rest can keep going. And then ultimately what the pros, quote unquote, do is they have redundant systems for each of those. So if the hmm. tracks A computer goes down, tracks B goes, you know, keeps going. And people are like, are you really telling me I need three computers? And it's like, well, I'm telling you, if we apply this principle, that's the best way to do it. But sometimes, you know, the best thing has to uh, be subservient to our budget and the realistic bit of like what we can afford to do or not. And sometimes a backup plan is just as simple as what you said, which is like, hey, um, man, we're going to try that again. That uh, We're having issues with our laptop. We're going to just roll with this. And it becomes these really cool moments, like you said, of like, you, you know, endearing moments where you walk away and you're like, man, you remember that one show? Like that, that I'm sold on that band for life because of that particular mm -hmm. moment. That's redundancy too. It's just make a plan, consider that. But there is gear, you know, you could buy to, to have that backup plan. But it doesn't mean rigidity and it doesn't mean lack of flexibility. And like my whole process of what I teach of using tracks on stage I teach a method so that you can have freedom of flexibility on stage and so that you're not staring at your computer and you're not stressed about your computer so that you're in the moment and focusing on the music. Because to me, like that's the point. Like the technology is not mm -hmm. the point. The, tech, the, the point is what's happening in the moment on stage. And that can still happen with tracks and that can still happen with a plan. But you can even use tracks in a way that you can repeat something. You could jump around. You could change tempo on the fly. You could skip you know, to a different song in your set list. But um, there, like you said, there's there's those principles that we could learn to apply to improve things. That doesn't mean we're going to live this dull life where we never have fun performing. Because every good performance or maybe good piece of art or whatever is like slightly on the edge of falling, you know, to complete utter disaster. So that chaos is like definitely a fun element. But we could definitely make plans to where it's not chaos to the point of being detrimental. Right. Well, that's a misconception a lot of people have about running backing tracks mm. or ha having any kind of computer involved if you're playing in a band, say, is that, well, now we can't do anything different. We can't yeah. extend the par. We, yep. we can't jam on this. We, we have to just go with how it goes. But um, especially if you have a dedicated person doing that kind of work, um, then 
it's surprisingly flexible, really. Yeah. I and all my performances were like the songs were almost never the same twice. Mm. And what really kind of blew me away was even though they were the same recordings, mm. the same loops playing every time I played was different. Like yeah. the reaction with the crowd, you would think it's the same music. It's the same. Cause in a band you might say like, oh, we didn't play right. My guitar tone was off. That's why tonight was weird. Yeah. But I had like the kind of like, you know, um, scientific, uh, the, uh, whatever they call it when they have the control, right? The control. Here, oh yeah. Yeah. The control experiment where no, everything's the same every time. It's, there's other things at work here yeah. that are, playing into whether or not this is a good show. Yeah. You have the same exact sounds coming out. You're just doing something different. You know, honestly, Brian, as you're thinking, um, or as, you're th as you're talking, and I'm thinking, I the, the picture of um, a chef and cooking came into mind, like as maybe two different ways in thinking of performing is like, I love cooking, um, but the way I love to cook, my daughter the other day was super precious. She's like, Dad, I love when you cook when you're inspired. And because like my favorite times to cook is to walk down and be like, ah, I got to make dinner. And I just open the fridge and I look and I look at like the, the veggies and the fruit we have and I go to the pantry and I'm like, all right, let's see what happens. And I just find some things and I make it. And like, you know, there's certain recipes we have or, or certain meals that we eat as a family that like every time I'm like, oh, what if I tried this and did these flavors and see what happens? And almost every time we eat it, it's slightly different. And I think maybe from a performance perspective, like some of us love that and love the like, let's just see what happens. And that's not chaos. That's like, I, you know, I add a little bit of salt, so I need something to balance this. Oh, a little too much. So let's, let's add a little bit of this. Whereas the other approach is like, I can go, I can eat that food and it's delicious, or I can go to a fine restaurant with a, a chef that has defined kind of what the recipe is and said, these are the exact amounts of what goes into the recipe. Or I could buy a recipe book that says, this is exactly what to do and follow that recipe. And either way, the food's delicious. It's just the, the means of producing it are maybe a little different. And you can't be in a restaurant and be like, I just feel inspired to do a little bit of this. Like the chef's going to look at you and be like, get the hell out. Like, the, you know, this isn't your show. Like, I just need you to stir this pot. You know, like that's what I need you to do to play your part to do that. And, yeah, I don't know. As you were talking, I was like, maybe that's a good analogy to understand, you know, why. And again, I talk about session view and arrangement view for live performance. Like, they're two different mindsets. And to me, session view is the let's have some experiments and let's see what happens and let's do something that's like completely nonlinear. And arrangement view is we start with an arrangement that's linear and we could still be very nonlinear in that. But that's like, I'm starting with my recipe. I know if I press play and get to the end, the results of the recipe will be good and we can still change it up and change the order that the dishes come out as opposed to like, I've got these ingredients, let's mix them together in session view and see what we get. And every time it's different and fun and in one context, this is great. And in another context, this is great. So I don't know, maybe, hmm. maybe that's a good analogy. Maybe it's just cause I'm hungry, but um, <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about that. It's like, Oh, that's a good way to think about that. Yeah. Uh, cooking, tends to work a lot you know mm. whether you're i i think i did it i think it was a podcast mason plus i think is yeah yeah say it. everything in place you know, where, yeah. yeah where you, you get your stuff ordered together first the the chef doesn't have access to every ingredient ever they pick it yeah. and that's what they work with and like the point of that episode was to say that pick out some things to work with mm. and then make it yeah you know, rather than every possible thing it's really good and that, i think that works too there's a time and a place for like reproducing the thing exactly and then to uh get a little weird with it yeah and that's good that's and that just kind of speaks to the flexibility of this whole thing and that's something that i think really drew me in in the early days was like hey like you know like live electronic music whatever that means not electronic in genre but just in electronic sound i guess it can be very expressive and can be performed. It doesn't have to just be this same thing every time. It's yeah. a very straight thing. And it can be, you can make it like an instrument that you play. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. I always encourage my students 
uh, even more talking about backing tracks is I'm like Ableton's an instrument and you you don't pick up your guitar and <clears throat> after a week you're suddenly like playing Cliffs of Dover like you got to learn some scales you got to learn the notes on the neck you got to learn how to tune it and then your fingers are going to hurt really really bad and you got to build the calluses so you can then eventually get to Cliffs of Dover and I think um, often we we open Ableton for the first time. And we get frustrated and say, oh, this software is too complicated. It's, it's not user-friendly. It's not blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and I think there's times for companies to maybe do a better job. I think Ableton actually does one of the better jobs of software that I use at being user-friendly and getting it out of the way. But uh, mm. we get frustrated or I'll have people sign up and they have their first live show in two weeks. And they're like, I want to <clears throat> start using tracks. And I'm like, well, do you guys have in-ears? Well, no. Have you played with Click? Well, no. Well, okay, that, that's a big jump to go from zero yeah. to Cliffs of Dover in the span of two weeks. So like, give it some time, devote yourself to the instrument, get the reps in, and then you can blaze the Eric Johnson tunes as, as much as you want. It's true. A, a buddy of mine and I had a joke uh, where you know he was just getting into using Ableton, and uh, it was like, well, you know. Now that we have the program, we'll just have the hits. And he's yeah. like pretending he's on like, you know, some kind of like interview late in his career. It's like, well, you know, the first thing we did was download the software and uh, there you go. We had it. And then we had it. <laughs> like it just started happening. But that's not it. And I, I tell people the same thing. It's it's an instrument. Yeah. You know, it's like your studio is an instrument. Yep. And it's like a guitar. You have to learn it and stuff. But you also have to build the guitar. Mm. You have to construct it. You have to figure out what components you're going to use, what controllers, how you're going to map them. Yeah. So there's like that part too. And you're not going to get ready in two weeks yeah. for your show. You're like You really do need to rehearse like you're learning an instrument, which, you know, that's it's just the truth, but it's part of why it's cool because you can make it so customizable. Like I'm sure you've you don't know anybody that uses it the same way as somebody else. Like everybody's got their own approach to it. Yeah. It's pretty cool when you start talking to people that are also live users. You're just like, wow, you do that. You do that this way. You do this. It's so, um, you know, moldable to whatever you want to do. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Hmm. Well, what do you think? Maybe we'll wrap this up and, uh, call it a day and is there anything else you want to get to before we uh do that anything on your mind no i mean i think uh i would encourage people that um again if you if you tend to be more from the live looping camp or whatever like i'd love to hear from you solo artist um if you're if the whole idea of backing tracks feels really difficult very like you know we're talking about able to be an instrument and and you're like Oh crap, that means I'm never going to be able to do this. I don't have that time. Um, something I've worked really, really hard on over the past year is just trying to simplify the easiest first step for people. <clears throat> and um, so uh, I'll shoot you the link if you want to throw it in the show notes. But if you go to from studio to stage.com slash template, from studio to stage.com slash template, I have a uh, free tracks template that I put together um, for people that. Uh, want to learn how to use backing tracks on stage. I teach what's called the three-part framework for using tracks. It allows you to use tracks in a way that's flexible, stable, and efficient, meaning it's not going to take you a long time to get up and running and do it. Um, and I think that's particularly helpful for people that are coming from a you know live looping, non-linear thing that want to use tracks and maybe feel like it's going to hinder them. You know, It's a different skill set. It's a different kind of set of knowledge. And so uh, that template's completely free, available for every version, every edition of Ableton. Uh, plus, there's, I think, a six-day email course where it's not just getting the template, but I explain exactly how to use it to format your songs, to load it in. And that applies whether you're using it in an electronic context, a, a folk band, a heavy metal band, uh, whatever it is, like whatever your context, um, those concepts apply there. So um, anyone that, that wants to check that out, I would encourage, that's like a good first step that's a real easy, tangible way to try it out, to see, and again, to kind of add a different skill set to maybe your, your tools. Um, if you're either starting, one is starting to use tracks, or again, coming from a non-linear, like live looping background, um, it's a really helpful, helpful tool for sure. 
Mm, I like that approach. And I, I say the same thing. Like, yeah, you do have to build the instrument, but you don't have to build like a 24 string guitar for your first yeah. thing. <clears throat> Let's get Iterate, it. like we were saying yeah. earlier. You know, my live performance set is its ancestors are from like 20, probably like 2009, even to maybe nice. 2010. Yeah. And I've just saved as, save as, save yep. as, build a new version. Try, I've added things. I've taken things away. It started much smaller. It, it probably swelled to much bigger than it is. And then mm. it kind of pared back down again as I figured out what I needed. But I just put things in there as I wanted them. Mm. You know, as you play, as you perform, be like, oh, it would be cool if we could do this. Yeah. It would be cool if we could do that. And then bring it in. It's the same iteration process we were talking about with all this other stuff. Yep. That... You don't have to start at the top of whatever you're trying to do. Like again, it's just like your your videos. Start in your apartment in Fort Lauderdale with like one camera. Yeah. And work up from there. That's right. That's exactly right. Nice, man. Well, thanks so much. This has been a fun continuation to what we did last week. And um, people should check out Behind the Space Bar, Behind the Space Bar, excuse me, on your YouTube channel, which is from studio to stage, which is really a great channel. I mean, like all this stuff is is there and in lots of detail. Um, it's almost hard to think of what you haven't covered yet, <laughs> but there's always an idea, I guess. Always, so. yeah. <clears throat> People should check that out and um, keep in line with what you're doing and reach out if you have some thoughts of what Will can do next because he's he's listening. Yeah, I always, I always tell people, like, I love, I do my best to read every single comment. Uh, some I just delete. If you tell me I'm dumb and ugly, I'll just delete you. Mm -hmm. But I, I do love when people give feedback and say, man, you completely missed this. You should have said that. That stuff's incredibly, incredibly beneficial. So keep it coming. Mm. Nice. Well, thank you, man. And thank you to all of you listening. Appreciate your time and we hope you have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Production Podcast with Will Doggett. Will works in live sound and being on stage and performing, and that's always a collaborative process, even if you're a solo artist. And it got me thinking about collaborations in general and a conversation I had with my band about collaborating. And in a musical collaboration, whether it's a band or just one other person, the most important thing is not the music. It's the relationship. You can always make more music. So maybe if you have to make a sacrifice in order to salvage the relationship and to keep the other person happy, make that sacrifice. Remember to leave your ego at the door when you're making music with other people. Try to make the best music you can possibly make. But don't forget, the most important thing is that relationship. That can't be replaced. You can make a new song next time, but you can't make a new relationship. So cherish those collaborators of yours, your bandmates, and have a great day. Thank you.